Basketball coach Nick Nolte allows recruiting payoffs to get him a fabulous talent in the form of Shaquille O'Neal in Blue Chips, a recruiting scandal story that's one of the big movies we're going to be reviewing this week on Siskel and Ebert, along with the revival of the only X-rated Oscar-winning Best Picture. Can you name it? And also critics criticizing The Critic, our reaction to the new animated primetime TV series The Critic about a movie critic who some say bears a resemblance to us. I'm Gene Siskel of the Chicago Tribune. And I'm Roger Ebert of the Chicago Sun-Times. Our first movie is Blue Chips, and although the ads make this look like a basketball comedy, it's actually a pretty hard-hitting drama about the world of big-time college basketball. The movie stars Nick Nolte as a coach at a school where he's won two national titles, but now he's facing his first losing season. He's always been scrupulously honest in his recruiting practices, but there's pressure on him to produce or lose his job. He talks it over with his friend, the athletic director, played by Boston Celtics legend, Bob Cousy. What if I break the rules and I get caught, I'll get kicked out of coaching. And what's the second reason? I might not get caught. Nolte goes after some of the top prospects in the country, including a player from Louisiana, played by Shaquille O'Neal. He ain't no brain surgeon, all right? Took the SAT recently, scored 520 out of a possible 1,600. 520? You get 400 for just spelling your name correctly. That's it. Messed up on his name. Another top prospect has a tough mom, played here by Alfrey Woodard. She has a good idea of what she'd like out of her son's basketball career. Miss McRae, do you really want your son to start out life by learning how to bend and break the rules? I mean, what's he going to be when he grows up and he's out in the world? Now he's responsible and the leader of other young men. What's he going to become? I mean it. And there's a high school star from Indiana played by Matt Nover who comes right out and says what he expects in order to sign. I figure a white blue chip athlete like myself deserves something extra. Um, so, you know, this is what I'm looking for, is about, about 30 grand. The movie raises some basic questions, such as, since big-time college sports are a multi-million dollar business, isn't it crazy that the players are supposed to be amateurs? Nolte finds it crazy, all right, but he believes in following the rules, and that interior struggle is what the movie is about. Blue Chips is written by Ron Shelton, who also wrote Bull Durham and White Men Can't Jump. He knows how to make a sports movie convincing, and the director, William Friedkin, makes this psychological battle as suspenseful as the sports battle that I was sort of expecting when I went into the theater. You know, Roger, I, I just disagree with you. I thought the film was really lightweight, and in this sense, I thought it was so simple-minded, bare-bones script from Ron Sheldon, who's a marvelous writer. This is a 12-year-old script, I'm told. It isn't to have an updated, fresh quality. All it is is he's facing the losing season. He, he, he has a losing season. He tolerates the recruiting uh, violations, and then he feels badly about him at the end, end of the movie. I well, waited for that the story. what it's all about. That I, is the story. Isn't I waited, that the story, Roger, the pressures? What about all the pressures that are on him? The kinds of people who put the pressures on him. The I, way those, thought, the, to me, thought, the most chilling thing about the movie is the way that some of those players walk in with their demands. One wants $30,000 in an athletic bag. Yeah. Another, a tractor for his dad. Yeah. That's interesting. I, I, thought those were, I thought that those were sort of cornball movie nah, situations. You so. and I saw a picture called Hoop Dreams that of we course, reviewed yes, yeah. that is so much more sophisticated, so much more real in the playing. This seems so broad well, Gene, and phony. I agree with you about Hoop Dreams, but at the same time, I think you're comparing apples and oranges. Yeah, there. a good movie and a bad movie. Okay, next picture, the revival of a classic. The only X-rated uh, film ever to be named Oscar's Best. I'm talking, of course, about Midnight Cowboy, now celebrating its 25th anniversary. A new sound and picture remastered print is being re-released around the country, and yes, you should see it. It holds up very well, coming across as shockingly contemporary in its depiction of hustlers on our city streets. But I've always thought of Midnight Cowboy as more of one of the movie's most unlikely love stories, between a West Texas kid who dreams of being a stud for hire in New York City 
and the sickly Bronx lowlife he meets there and serves as his manager. Hey, I'm walking here. I'm walking here. Another great scene is when Ratso Dustin Hoffman breaks the news to Joe Buck, John Voight, that his cowboy act just won't cut it in the big city. Oh, what the hell do you know about women anyway? When's the last time you scored, boy? That's a matter I only talk about a confession. We're not talking about me now. Well, when's the last time you've been to confession? It's between me and my confessor. I called it a love story, and here is one of those love story scenes as Ratso feels his life slipping away. Joe has just scored 20 bucks with a woman and now buys Ratso medicine and soup. I don't think I can walk anymore. I mean, I've been falling down a lot. I'm scared. Those are two perfect, incomparable performances. And you know, Roger, that scene where they run, the fantasy scene where they run along the beach mm -hmm. together? I wonder if those two young men knew that they were making a classic when they did it. There's so much joy there. But both lost to John Wayne in True Grit at the Academy Awards, and even Wayne himself knew that wasn't his best work. And in a great coincidence, he's actually referred to by name in Midnight Cowboy as the film turns into a rumination by director John Schlesinger on what does constitute manhood and on the loneliness that envelops so many people even when they're jam-packed together in the biggest of our big cities. It was great to see Midnight Cowboy again. Well, I thought it was great too, but on the other hand, I'm not sure John Wayne is right about True Grit. I think that was also a perfect and incomparable performance by John Wayne. And of course, once again, apples and oranges. In this film, one of the things that struck me is, here is a movie that was X-rated when it came out. Yeah, and then re-rated two years the later. the language, did you notice how mild it was? Compared yeah. to stuff we hear in R-rated movies today, yes. there wasn't a whole lot of four-letter language and obscenity. Yeah. People talked differently 25 years ago, and that's something you can get in touch with here. Yet at the same time, the sexuality in the film was much franker than most of the stuff you get today. Oh. It was really right there in terms of what people need, what they desire, what they fear, and what they get themselves into. And so it's like the movies have gotten... Uh, less so sexually sophisticated, while at the same time more they've violent. gotten more raw. Yeah. More. Yes. I do hope that people will take a chance to look at it again. You know, well, this it looks great. It's so they've got the color Perfect. together. They've got sound. the sound together. It's like looking at a new movie. Uh, you know what it was also looking like for two of us looking at our youth. Remember, we did that show on the early '70s. Yes. This was even a little bit before that. We were right. Movies were better then. Okay. <laughs> okay. When we come back, they're fresh out of college and looking for jobs and romance in Reality Bites. Come on, let's go. You don't need this. You don't know what she needs. I think I know what she needs in a way that you never will. He needs us, okay? If he makes videos, we show them, okay? It's, not, it's a symbiotic, it's like a chicken or the egg. It's both of them working together. Yeah? Uh, well, let me tell you something. I'm not scared of No, no, no. I'm not scared of Jesus! Hollywood calls it a meat cute. When Ona Ryder tosses a cigarette butt, and that's how she meets Ben Stiller in Reality Bites, a new comedy about 20-somethings in Houston. She's just out of college and working for a local TV station, but her real love is the video documentary she's making about her friends. Friends like Troy, played here by Ethan Hawke as an unemployed musician, her roommate has invited to share their apartment. Let's stay on the couch. Vicky, he will turn this place into a den of slack. Winona Ryder starts dating Ben Stiller, who is an executive with an MTV-style operation, and Ethan Hawke is scornful of her successful friend. Stiller is almost 30 and has a good job, so obviously he's got to be a sellout and a phony. Have I, like, uh, stepped over some line in the sands of coolness with you? Because, 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 no, 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 excuse me if somebody doesn't know the secret handshake with you. There's no secret handshake. There's an IQ prerequisite but there's no secret handshake. There's so much tension between them over Stiller that obviously there's something else going on too. Ethan Hawke obviously likes her a lot, but masks his feelings with hostility. And of course, since he's mad at her all the time, that forms a mutual attraction. Did he dazzle you with his extensive knowledge of mineral water? Or was it his in-depth analysis of uh, uh, Marky Mark that finally reeled you in? I just would have liked to have been there to, to watch how you rationalized sleeping with a yuppie head cheese ball on the first date. Reality Bites was written by a 23-year-old named Helen Childress, who does a good job of capturing the attitudes of her generation, but her movie raises a lot of fundamental questions. For example, a lot depends on the assumption that Ryder is making a good documentary and that Stiller allows the people at his network to destroy it. Unfortunately, we see enough of her documentary to realize that her character has no idea about how to frame a shot, how to choose material, or even how to hold a camera. She is making a terrible documentary. What Stiller's people does to it is almost an improvement. 
Also, the movie's youthful bias requires Stiller to be the bad guy, even though Stiller is smarter and more interesting than the Hawk character, whose number one skill is sitting scornfully on the sofa. A little more insight would have made this a much better movie, oh. but she goes... Uh, the author goes cliche. directly for every obvious thing. You got that right. This film got me so angry because that Ben Stiller character yeah. is a good man. And you yes, know what I thought was going to happen? I thought, I was sitting there and saying, oh my God, they're not going to go for the cliche. Mm -hmm. This is a great guy. Mm -hmm. She's going to reject the jerk. Think She's going to reject the jerk, but no, no. In, a, in a last minute save. Got to go for him. He's, he's 22 save. years old. He's oh, got to be got the a good job. guy. He's yeah. got to be a you know, complete jerk. I hate it. Who's, you know who the director is? You don't even know Ben Stiller. Of course I know. He yes, sold himself out. I know. That's he sold I said. his own yes. character yes. out. Yes. Now, here's the scene that I missed in the movie. Wouldn't it have been terrific if Stiller had sat down with Ryder and said, look, I love you, but I have to tell you something. First of all, you've got to learn how to operate a video camera, <laughs> and then you could go on to maybe think about making a documentary. Instead, this movie is imbued with the bias that if you're 23 years old and you turn on a camera and point it at your friends who are saying idiotic things, then that makes a movie. Yeah, but it's the, it's the choice of the man that got right, me so angry. Right, the Coming, wrong guy. Wrong guy. Coming up next, we look at The Critic, the new animated TV series about, can you believe it, a movie critic. I like it. They get kind of a Siskel and Ebert thing going. Status in the critics section. Pelican wow. grief, more like turkey too long. From your mayonnaise. Even Satan himself would love this angel hair pasta. It's a goodbye. And so goodbye from Mr. Good Guy, Gene Shalit. It didn't surprise me, a new primetime TV show about a movie critic, a natural subject, wouldn't you say, Raj? Mm -hmm. But what did surprise me, and I like the concept, it's all animated from the same production company that gave us The Simpsons. Unfortunately, it doesn't have as many memorable characters as that series, just one self-loathing movie critic with a head bigger than mine and a body smaller than, well, he's losing weight, so we'll see. The critic is named Jay Sherman, voiced by John Lovitz, and the first episode was very funny with its movie parodies. Eat lead, Rabbi. Sorry, that's not kosher. All right. If you are a real rabbi, circumcise this child. <coughs> Ava Nagila, baby. It also featured a starlet coming on to Jay before he reviews her new movie. Now, I must confess, I haven't seen your movie yet. Well, let's not talk about the movie. Let's talk about you. Ah, my favorite subject. Ah! But the second episode let me well, down. It didn't seem to be about the world of a movie critic, just a single dad and his geeky son. Uh, how do you like America? My grandfather says your country will one day choke on the vomit of your capitalist excess. The third week was somewhere in the middle as Jay tangles with his spaced out, waspy, adoptive parents. Mother, you've been belittling me my whole life, and now I've got to say it. Shut up! Shut up, shut up, shut up! <laughs> you are a disgrace to this family. The jokes about Dad get a little tired. They do repeat the same one over and over. There are no other memorable characters in the show besides Jay. The station boss is an unfunny adult. Not as sharp as parody, I think, as it could be. Jay's kid is a twerp off the old block. If the critic is going to succeed, and I hope it does, it desperately needs to refocus itself on the movies and the way critics interact with them. Obviously, the show needs two things, a second critic and for Roger and me to write some of the scripts. We could save this show, and I, for one, would like to. Well, I'd be happy to give them some free advice, and one of them would be to build up some of the other characters, yes. and especially, I think you're wrong, I think the station boss has a lot of potential he's obviously kind of modeled on ted turner and i think there are enormous possibilities there i also there are feel possibilities make him sharper make him smarter okay, like okay. ted turner i also feel that the very best thing in the show so far has been the satires yes. of movies and they yes. ought to have two or three of those in every show Absolutely. current movies or kinds of movies and also yes. i'd like to see jay sherman watch television so that he could satirize and discuss uh, what's on television these days in other words Focus this show on the media mm -hmm. and not turn it into another sitcom about a guy and his, his son Weird and his ex-wife and his yeah. girlfriends and so forth. They, they have to focus on yeah. the movies. That's what the show should be about. And also, I think they ought to keep Jay Sherman as a smart critic. The, if, mm -hmm. they, if they make his criticisms smarter, mm -hmm. he can still have a bad self-image, but make him a smart mm -hmm. guy because mm -hmm. then they'll, 
their targets will be you much know, sharper. I actually think that Jay Sherman is much smarter than I expected him to be before I saw the show. I, I think that he's, I want he to, is intended to be relatively intelligent. I want him to open up and really knock some pictures out. Okay, when we come back, one of this year's Oscar nominees, The Scent of Green Papaya. Papaya is the first Vietnamese movie ever nominated in the foreign language category of the Academy Awards. Set in 1951 in Saigon, it's about a 10-year-old girl who was hired as a servant in a middle-class household. She is sweet and dutiful and does her job quietly and well, but she's still a child and this new world is filled with wonders for her. The film is set entirely in Saigon, but what's amazing is that it was filmed entirely in Paris, on a soundstage where everything inside and outdoors was constructed. The father of the household where the young woman is employed becomes ill and dies. And halfway through the film, the time moves to the early 60s, and the heroine goes to work in another house, the home of one of the best friends of her former employers. She has had a crush on this young man since they were both children, but now, finally, he notices her. The Sin of Green Papaya is an elegant but very simple film about a young woman who grows up and finds love. It's basically a Cinderella story. And what I like best about it is that it portrays its romance in terms that are honest, direct, and very visually beautiful. This film sees with a special clearness everything from a papaya seed to drops of water on a leaf to the look in an eye to a little frog in a pond and it hears clearly too in a quiet household where every sound has a meaning. Very rarely does a film create a time and place with more attention and love than this film does. It's hypnotic and enchanting. You uh, left out the ants. Uh, she stares, well, while she's doing her work oh, yeah, as a little yeah. girl, she stares at these ants who are mm -hmm. uh, handling tremendous burdens, and obviously she can identify, I have yeah. a feeling, yeah. with the ants. It also remembers what it's like to do women's work in a women's world. Um, the, the, the special quality of many foreign films is that they are about something beyond their story. Mm -hmm. This is a love story. It's a Cinderella story, a young woman growing up. At the same time, it focuses, just like, on, like Water for Chocolate focuses on food, mm -hmm. this focuses on the housework that this woman must mm -hmm. do and what it is like to do that. It's also absolutely refreshing in that it's a Vietnamese film in which war is not the central subject. No, occasionally you hear a war plane flying over, and that I think is an echo of the war that's still to come. But, but this the, is yeah, this is not about the victimization. No, it's not, of, no, it's about life in Vietnam, yeah. especially 40 years it's ago. It's a special yes. film. Coming up next, one of the most controversial movies of last year that never got a fair shake with the public. A second chance now. It's coming out on home video, this video pick of the week. And long before the film Boxing Helena was released last year, it was mired in controversy, being dismissed as a sordid tale of a woman who is dismembered by a would-be lover. Sherilyn Fenn got the title role after others turned it down, and I went to the theater to see it expecting the worst. What I found instead was a brave little movie that explored the provocative issue of how some frustrated men channel their inability to love a woman into cruelty. Julian Sands entraps Sherilyn Fenn in his home and limb by limb reduces her to something he can manage. Screech to those people in that window can hear you! Let me hear you! My God, hear you! Now, a lot of people, most everybody, missed it the first time around. You now have a second chance with Boxing Helena, our video pick of the week. Now let's recap the movies we reviewed on this show. We split on the basketball recruiting picture, Blue Chips. Roger thought it was truthful and absorbing. I felt it was only a surface treatment of a fascinating issue. Two thumbs up, however, for the revival of the great Midnight Cowboy. Celebrating its 25th anniversary, it does stand the test of time with two classic performances in an offbeat love story. It opens next week in a number of cities around the country. Check it out. But two thumbs down for Reality Bites, a promising post-college love story that really cops out at the end with a standard movie conclusion. And finally, two thumbs up for The Scent of Green Papaya, the Vietnamese Oscar candidate for Best Foreign Language Film. So the best pictures on the show are a 25-year-old American picture, Midnight Cowboy, and Green Papaya. And I hope people go to see Green Papaya because the beauty of this film just kind of washes over you. It's kind of refreshing and resting to see it. That's it for this week. Next week, we'll be back with reviews of On Deadly Ground, starring Steven Seagal as an Alaskan oil rigger battling corporate shark Michael Caine. And also, Eight Seconds, starring Luke Perry as a rodeo cowboy who has trouble dealing with success. That's next week, and until then, the balcony is closed.